Hi, everybody, and sorry for not giving any update or sort of announcement really about this live until today because I don't plan anything because I am a busy person and planning is hard. Um, so anyways, I decided to just do this while I have time after working today and trying to get one of those like shelter logic livestock shelters up in my horse's field, which was a nightmare and we didn't get done. So anyways, with that said, like I'm done and I'm tired and I'm going to go hang out and lay low after this, but I didn't have time to be like, hey, heads up, I'm going to be doing a YouTube live. So here we are. Anyways, um, if you don't follow my Instagram, you probably don't even know what questions I'm talking about because they've only been up for a couple of hours on my Instagram. So I made like a question thing on my Instagram for people to ask me uh, questions about like horse behavior and training. So if you miss that, you can comment some in the live chat and I will answer those as well as I go. And that's my dog sleeping in the background. She says hi. Um, yeah, so you can ask in the YouTube chat. And yes, this is live unless like, yeah, if you're commenting in the chat right now, it's live. It should say live on your screen. Um, but anyways, I'm going to start with the Instagram questions and I'll also look at the YouTube questions as we go. And this is my cat. Sorry, it's like a party in here because... I am finally sitting down and they're like, sweet, now we get to hang out. Um, so I'm just going to open up the Instagram questions and um, basic. <laughs> oh, shoot. Sorry. That's just my story. Um, so basically, um, I'm going to just preface this with like, I'm not like an expert, but I am taking like an advanced equine behavior course and I've taken other courses through Guelph on like equine science. So essentially what I'm going to do here is try to just share the things that I've learned with you in answering questions about it. Um, if it's harder for people to find access to things or if it's been hard to find things explained in a way, if you're like starting out, I'm going to try to kind of be the middleman for sharing that voice. Um, so anyways, I asked people to ask mostly generalized question. If you have specifics about like a, your horse and like a very specific situation, it's really hard to like accurately answer those without getting full context, which is better done off the live because um, there's a lot of nuance to behaviors. So I'm going to be trying to answer the more generalized questions about equine behavior um, I'm going to start at the bottom of the Instagram ones. So someone, the first one that I got in on Instagram was, do horses really yawn after stressful situations? And it, yes, it can be like a release, like licking and chewing and yawning. But like context matters because there's other situations where they would yawning because they're relaxed and stuff. But they can yawn and like lick and chew as they like let down from being previously stressed. And it doesn't even have to be like a huge stressor. Like horses will literally lick and chew like, if they hear something in the distance that they might not even necessarily react to, but that they're a little concerned about for that moment and they can let down from it. But yawning is contextual. So if you're even watching horses out in a herd, they can be hanging out and they'll yawn. But if they're yawning like repeatedly and stuff, it's probably something else. But anyways, the next one, this is a really good and common question is lazy horses. What's the deal? So with lazy horses, like there's obviously different personalities in horses. Some horses are naturally more forward under saddle both and in the field. They'll want to play more. They'll be more reactive to things. They'll be more sensitive. And then you'll have horses who even on their own time are like quiet and less reactive, not as spooky, easier to get introduced to things. So there's different personalities. But with that said, like horses who are like notoriously dead to leg and like do not respond to things and they're like the ones that you have to like whack at. Like think of the stereotypical lesson pony that people would call lazy. Typically with those types of horses, they've been like over habituated to legs. So when you put your leg on, they ignore it. And it can be because of like incorrect cueing at the wrong time and then they become used to the leg cue and they are more used to it than a horse would before they know the leg cue when they're trained it. And they've been essentially taught to ignore it. It can also be because horses are like sore or stiff or just not into work. So generally speaking, it's something that you can make better with training. But people use it as just saying, like, this horse is, like, stubborn or lazy, like, doesn't want to work. He, he needs to get nagged at. And usually it's, like, how they've been trained or how they're responding to. Um, I, yeah, I don't know what's going on in the chat right now. If you can't tell, I haven't been reading the YouTube one. Um, yeah, I don't even know what that's... Okay. <laughs> um, 
The next one, this is another good one because this actually relates to Milo, is rescues who can be mouthy but never bite. And I know what you're talking about in that they'll like mouth at your clothes, like grab your clothes when they're bored, like tied, standing tied in new situations and stuff. Milo used to always do that where he'd kind of be like, meh, 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 meh. And when he was younger, he was way mouthier than he is now. Like he would always have his mouth on people, especially when he was in nervous circumstances. So... I, it's like a release of behavior, like frustration, stress, boredom, because typically they do it or they can also be mouthing at you because they view you as reinforcing and they're trying to like grab at you for treats and whatnot. But in the context, I think you're probably talking about here, it's probably due to like nerves or being like uneasy in a certain situation because Milo still does it to an extent, but he's also a rescue and he was very orally fixated, which is also probably due to being starved and stuff. But when he was nervous, it would go up to a new level where he'd kind of just always pick at your clothes and he wouldn't bite, but every now and then he would accidentally pinch people's skin. But he was just always constantly grabbing at people or licking people and stuff. And it was for him like a release of frustration or nerves if he was having to stand longer than he wanted to or if he was uncomfortable in a situation. It was like a redirection behavior to cope with what he was feeling in that moment. So I'm assuming that's what you're talking about with that question. Um, I don't see anyone hating, so um, it, I might I might mute some people in the YouTube chat because it's making it hard to keep track of questions. So um, no fighting in the YouTube live part of the chat. Um, okay, I'm going to just... Um, sorry, how would you explain? How would you explain dominant behavior when there are enough resources so it doesn't seem like resource guarding and it's also not playing if horses aren't dominant? It's not like horses when they exhibit dominance behavior, like chasing each other away from like their friends or food or something. They're not doing it with the intention of being like, I'm going to be the herd leader at the top of the herd. Even if there's enough resources, if they're not spaced out enough or for whatever reason, the horse, if they're hungrier than usual or if they view a type of feed that you're feeding is more highly reinforcing than another feed or for if there's just not enough space in the field and they feel like they need to guard for whatever reason, it doesn't matter if you've always given them food, they can still resource guard. And even stuff like water or people or the horses that they like better than the other horses, those are all resources that they would guard. So it doesn't need to be a situation where they haven't been fed or you're scarce on resources for them to resource guard. So generally speaking, when you see dominant behavior, it's an expression of resource guarding, like frustration, or like even just telling them to like stay out of their space because there's horses, like I said earlier, with different personalities. Some horses might have a bigger personal bubble than others. And while they're getting adjusted in a herd setting, especially in most domestic styles of keeping horses where they're in smaller turnouts and stuff you're more likely to see those behaviors like if you had horses out on 100 acres you'd probably see a lot less resourcing resource guarding and fighting than you would see at any urban farm um and especially if they had like enough grass and water to sustain themselves just because there's more space so dominant behavior in the herd fluctuates like what people perceive as dominant behavior i mean it can fluctuate from day to day from horse to horse and their pres their positions in a hierarchy are not necessarily static in the way that humans perceive them and also exerting dominance over a horse for training hasn't been found to be accurate in studies so if you're referencing dominance theory and stuff um, it doesn't apply to horses in the sense that people say it does. Uh, okay. If an off the track thoroughbred is sensitive around his belly, but was treated for ulcers, could it be behavioral? Yeah. Horses can also just be less, I mean, more sensitive in other areas and of their body than, and just ticklish and uncomfortable. If he's being like really kicky, if you touch him anywhere, he still could have ulcers, even if you've treated for them. And your only way of knowing that would be to scope him and look. So it could be a number of things. So if you've not scoped him, I would maybe consider scoping him to make sure you're treating the correct type of ulcers because they can have like foregut or hindgut ulcers, like stomach ulcers or hindgut ulcers. So you generally need to treat with different types of medications. And depending on how bad they are, you might need to treat for longer or more aggressively. Um, so you can't definitively rule out ulcers, even if you've treated for them, but it could also be due to a number of things like back pain or anything, depending on what context, um, and where on his belly. 
Um, okay, I'm gonna answer a few of the YouTube ones, but guys, please, like, I'm gonna mute if you keep having silly little tiffs in the chat because it's hard to keep track of questions. Uh, what's the best positive reinforcement tool for a horse that's not particularly food motivated? I would really try to work with different treats to see if they are food motivated and also assess like their level of unease or stress in any situation to see why they're not eating. Because generally speaking, food is a very high reinforcer for horses. But with that said, if you're not using food, if they have certain spots that they're quite itchy or more tactile, you can itch them in those spots. Um, and use that as a reward, but it's typically not as strong of a reward as um, food is. Um, okay, I'm also going to mute the people if you're going to answer questions for me, because um, there's not really any point in me doing a live if other people are going to answer them in the chat, because also um, giving a horse like removing pressure from a horse isn't a reward. They don't enjoy that other than it's a release of an aversive. So positive reinforcement is not that because positive reinforcement directly refers to the addition of something as a reward, not the subtraction. So um, that's not correct. So don't listen to that response in the chat because positive reinforcement isn't that. And if you're looking to really give a high reward for a horse, Generally speaking, if they like food or scratches, that'll be a higher reward than release of pressure because they're seeking to avoid release of pressure. In the like, I'm not against negative reinforcement. I'm just saying that if you're choosing between food and scratches, horses would prefer scratches over release of pressure. Um, anyways, how to get a horse to calm down at something it's spooking at? My horse is young and tends to run me over when I'm when spooking and I want to help him. So. Again, it depends on context. If your horse is afraid of something, especially if it's something that you can control when you're working with them, which is a good time to practice fearful behaviors because in situations where you can't control what the horse is scared of, where like something that is a variable that's out, like if you catch a horse in a storm and you're riding it and lightning and thunder starts cracking, there's not a ton you can do to control that. But in the arena, you can. So then it's easier to work on fear behaviors when you are controlling the scary thing for the horse. So I would work with your horse in the arena and start teaching him to seek and like look at the things that you are controlling that he might be afraid of, like seek out and touch them and investigate. And you're not going to force him up to it. You're going to gradually, because if you give horses time, it's a very natural behavior for horses to approach things if they don't appear threatening. So with that said, um, you, you give them some time. If they're really, really afraid of it and they're in a situation where they're leaping around and completely losing it, take them to an area where they're probably still looking at the thing, still nervous of the thing, but can assess it without having high amounts of fear. And then when they relax there, you can gradually urge them forward. And this is why it would be good to have treats or some type of reward in this situation. Because essentially what you would do is have the horse in an area where it is relatively comfortable and then gradually get it to move closer to the object on their of their own accord while rewarding the forward attempts or calm behavior while they're standing. And then what you would get is you'd have the response where they want to go and see the thing. And then once they get closer, you teach them to seek the thing and touch the thing, investigate the thing, because you've essentially been rewarding the forward movement to go investigate, investigate the thing that they're afraid of. And then the closer they get, basically the behavior you would be wanting to teach is that when they're afraid of something, they kind of reach out and look at it and stand calm and gradually go towards it and trust you enough to keep them safe that they're willing to do this. And then in situations, even when you can't control the variable that they are afraid of, They'll trust you to make a decision more so than they would if you chase them towards things and force them to be there. Um, and this is super important for like really, really dangerous situations because if a horse has been taught to be fearful and feel forced and stuck in a situation, they're more likely to react violently. And then it can screw you over in situations that are highly dangerous, but that you can't control. Um, so that's what I would do. And you can also do it with things that they're less afraid of. Like if it's just like a plastic bag, but they're willing to stand near you while you're holding it, but they just don't want it on them. You could teach them to do forward attempts towards the plastic bag and then gradually teach them to like nose at it and target that object 
And you can also teach them to target like a thing, like a, the end of a whip and get them to follow the whip towards whatever you want the, to show them. So there's like a number of different ways of teaching the same behavior. But I would say in any case that the horse is afraid of something, you don't want to put them in a situation where they have to either fear you more or the thing more because then you're forcing them into kind of a lose-lose situation and it doesn't really instill confidence in horses especially really really nervous horses that can't get bullied as easily um okay i'm gonna go back to instagram questions in a second but i'm gonna my horse my my horse grinds her teeth quite frequently is this bad behavior is she in pain so grinding is like a stress behavior so it could be due to pain or it could be due to stress so it could be like a behavior you see more with like ulcerated horses. It could be a behavior you see with horses who have saddle fit pain, horses who are just anxious under saddle or anxious being tacked or anxious in any given scenario. They can be anxious even when you're working with them in hand or lunging. Grinding is just a stress behavior. So if she does it frequently, I would try to watch and look at when she does it and what situation she does it in and then try to find the similarities between those situations to try to figure out what is causing her to feel that stress if it's like likely a pain related behavior like it happens while you're attacking her i would say probably ulcers or something um but there's a number of things so i try to narrow it down by just witnessing when when it happens um what brand of treats do you find horses like the most it really depends on the horse some horses are exceptionally picky Generally speaking, I would say the best treats that would work are really kind of smaller ones if you're using them for training. You don't want to give them like the big like molasses-y like kick cookies because they take too long to eat. So if you're feeding something like that, you would have to like break it into pieces. So I typically use like hay pellets or I don't know if they have them in the States, but they have them here. It's, um, frick, I forgot the name of it. They're these tiny little like like peanut shaped is the best way of putting it treats and they use like the actress that plays amy fleming on heartland to like advertise it and the, they're like amber marshall uses these treats but i can't remember what brand it is but basically any like smaller treat they usually like apple flavored ones i feed mint flavored ones or hay pellets is a good bet and there's also certain brands of grain that have like that, that are like lower calorie grains, but have bigger pieces that you can feed as treats that work quite well. But um, anyways, I'm going to pick an Instagram question now because there are lots of them and I did ask them first. But um, how can you tell the difference between irresponsible and responsible breeders? This is a really good question. It's not necessarily totally behavior based, but I think it's relevant. And I think that there's so much variation because some people will take it as hardcore as like, unless you're breeding like an Olympic caliber horse, don't breed. Um, but like, I think that breeders that are breeding for huge amounts of foals each year have to have like way higher quality horses being like being bred if they're breeding that number into the foal pool every year, like they, I don't believe in huge breeding practices unless they're breeding exceptional foals. Um, and with that said, I would say res irresponsible breeding is definitely people like breeding their horse because they like the horse without actually like looking into the horse's confirmation, like looking to breed a foal that is like registerable. Like you need to think about it from the perspective of if someone did not know your horse, didn't care about your horse's personality, didn't value the horse you were breeding at all, how likely would your horse be to be to sell for a decent amount of money that would keep it safe from slaughter without any training if you weren't able to train it? Because relying on someone being able to raise a foal until it's actually useful as a riding horse isn't a good excuse. So I don't think anyone should breed unregistered horses that won't be able to be registered because you can find these types of horses a dime a dozen at most auctions usually. And even with registered horses, no offense to quarter horses, but in my area in specific, there's tons and tons of papered quarter horses that get run through the auction that are selling for like under a thousand dollars. And I think that's super irresponsible for people to keep breeding horses in that price range that are completely flooding the market and hard to find homes for and essentially have no value. And some of them are more valuable as meat. So the horses are just screwed from the get go because they don't have a high enough value and they're not there. There's too many of them for the market that they're selling into and then they end up going to slaughter and it's not the greatest um anyways 
The question about refusing, I would say that that's a fear-based behavior. So using the stuff with regards to spooking that I was talking about before, where you want to get the horse to slowly approach it, I would recommend doing it on the ground first and taking the horse in hand to go check out like poles and stuff. So it depends on like what they're refusing over. If it's, if they're even refusing a cross rail, I would take it right down to poles, get the horse to investigate the poles, get them really comfortable walking over the pole, seeking the pole, and then gradually build it towards being like small jumps, get them walking towards the pole and not the, the pole, not the pole, walking towards the pole and like investigating it, walking over it, walking over it with another pole after it, building it up to a slightly bigger jump. Same thing, getting them comfortable at the base level and then gradually building. And then if they do stop, don't get mad at them when they stop. Don't crop them once they've already stopped. If you hit them at the base of the fence, you're just teaching them to have anxiety at the base of the fence. So if they stop, they stop. And you kind of just have to be like, okay, this sucks. Let them look at the fence. You can walk them around in a circle around the fence, both directions. Let them investigate it. And depending on how hard they're stopping, I would also consider dropping the fence and then gradually putting it back up. But then when you do your next pass, let them get a good look, nice wide hands, and just ride them up to it. And if they're not confident at all and they stop again, then you need to let them investigate, show them it's okay. And basically build confidence because for horses, they are their natural behavior is to avoid going over things unless they have to because for safety reasons in the wild, if they, it, it's not worth the physical output if they don't know for sure that it's safe. So um, anyways, take it slow don't hit them at the base of the fence and try not to make it a hyper stressful experience because then they'll stop more in the future speaking from experience it's not a good thing to do and at the mystical rose lady in the comments no i'm not saying the cheaper the horse the less of a chance to do anything with my horse was 400 dollars, and i've done a lot with him i'm saying that he should have never been bred technically because for his sake he's not the type of horse that needed to get reproduced on a mass level he ended up getting starved almost to death and if it weren't for the SBC stepping in he would have died so people like that do not need to be breeding he shouldn't have been bred it wasn't responsible breeding i don't think people should breed horses they can't take care of and i don't think people should breed horses that are already flooding the market and getting shipped to slaughter because you're essentially just banking on the fact that someone will find that horse and like it enough to give it a home when when you're making the choice to breed you could stop that from happening in the first place and way too many of them are shipping to slaughter. Cheap horses can be great, but there's way too many horses that aren't worth anything that are shipping to slaughter, like hundreds of thousands each year. And it's not responsible to add to that market. So if you're going to breed, it should be a step above the market that would be at any risk of going there if someone doesn't put the amount of training and care into them to make them a valuable horse or keeps them themselves. Um, so... Cheap horses can be great, though. So it's nothing on cheap horses, but they don't need to be breeding. So um, I think rescues are great, but there's not enough people that are getting them to make it make sense to br breed a horse that could potentially end up one. Um, do you recommend feeding pasture-kept horses anything else, like supplements or extra nutrition? I would say it depends on the quality of your pasture. Like, you'd have to really do a test on it to see, but generally speaking, most pastures won't be completely balanced so you could feed a ration balancer but i can't speak for it without knowing your horse's diet um how do you know when your horse has reached their max potential and you shouldn't push them farther it depends on what you're doing there'd be different signs per discipline but if they're ending if they're getting really sour to ride or like getting injured a lot or are physically like incapable of consistently doing the level you're asking them to do then i would say those would all be indicators that they're probably not um with that said like some injuries are healable and a lot of sour behaviors could be related to the training program more so than the horse not being able to do what it's asked so there's so much variation in it um, but the easiest tell, I guess, that would be across all boards is if you can't keep them sound and they keep going lame with like injuries that are directly related to your sport and um, that sort of thing. But there's a lot of variation to that. Um, okay. I know that chestnut mares have stigma around them, but do you think that mares do act funny sometimes because of their gender? There are definitely like 
behaviors that are hormonal based that are specific to certain genders but i think that for the most part the stuff that people say about mares is like definitively because of a stigma and they're perpetuating like certain feelings onto them and kind of looking for certain behaviors to explain and blame on being a mare that they don't necessarily look into what's actually causing the behavior there's actually a study done that was posted like fairly recently comparing like horses across the genders and like reported bad behaviors like under saddle or on the ground and like mares actually beat geldings with like being good natured and having less bad behaviors it was a smaller scale study so you can't speak for it but i would say that it definitely doesn't happen to the extent to justify how often people will be like my horse is being this way and being cranky because she is a mare um but, like, with that said, like, mares will go into heat and they might act differently because of, like, changes in their body and, like, feel it, like, getting cramps and stuff. But, like, if you view it as, like, how people would view women, a lot of people, even with women who are perfectly capable of fully articulating their views on things and, like, clearly expressing their behavior in ways animal ca animals can't, it's way too common for, like, men and other sexist people and, like, even women to blame certain behaviors on, like, a woman being on her period when usually that's not, like, the actual cause behind it. And I think that it's too often viewed as, like, the easy way out of actually addressing the situation properly. So I think that taking hormones into account with like especially stallions and stuff and like if your mare is in heat being aware that she might be physically uncomfortable I think that's important but I think that people use gender to excuse behavioral problems that they could better address in other way um uh yes and also regarding the slaughter's question actually price does make it more likely because if a horse was bred and lands on the ground and is worth ten thousand dollars the odds of that horse getting to the point where it goes to an auction in mass quantities in the way that like very cheap backyard bred non-papered horses do are much slimmer because they're worth way more money when they hit the ground so they're not going to be likely ever sold for meat price unless something really bad happens so any horse can go to slaughter but if you look at the numbers the horses most represented are the ones that are unpapered like backyard bread or bread in mass quantities which is why for example quarter horses are going they're like 50 percent of breeds that go to slaughter are quarter horses and it's because the registry has so many horses being bred and there's also a lot of backyard bred unpapered quarter horses. But in North America, they're just everywhere. And they're more so they're overrepresented because of that. And you don't really see like you can find them, but it's like finding a needle in a haystack to go find like a papered warm blood that's like well bred at an auction because it doesn't happen in the same quantity. But yeah, so that's why I don't support irresponsible breeding because horses live for like 25 years and you can't guarantee that you're going to keep a horse for that long like even me with my own horses I could get struck by lightning tomorrow like my my whole family could get struck by lightning and no one can keep them and there would technically be the risk of me not being able to guarantee their safety so if I was breeding horses that weren't worth any money and that happened it would be very hard to find those horses home without the right resources which is why they end up in crappy situations um but uh, okay i'm gonna answer another instagram one because i'm trying to get to the top of these ones and i'll go back to youtube ones um what's the optimum amount of time to allow a horse eat and digest their grain before riding um, I would really say it depends on like how large their meal is. If they're eating a large meal, I wouldn't, I would try to not ride near your grading times and give them at least an hour to digest it. If they're only eating a small amount of grain, it matters less. But generally speaking, like I'll feed my horses like at the opposite time of day that I ride or they get, they get like they don't typically eat their grain before I ride them and they don't get a large amount. But if they're eating a large amount, definitely make sure that they have more space because um, horses don't have very big stomachs they digest things quickly but their stomachs are small so um one second picking another one from here what is your greatest tip to develop a better bond with your horse um getting them to trust you so like not being stress inducing when you're showing them things that are stress inducing you want them to kind of seek you as like a friend and like as they would 
another horse in a herd for comfort when they're afraid because when they're not with their herd you're their social comfort and it's really important for it's it's really important for people to sorry i just totally lost my train of thought it's really important for per people to be that person that their horse seeks for comfort if you want them to work with you as a partner especially since we're doing so many unnatural things with them for competition and care um and riding and like just base everything we want to do with our with horses like the typical horse owner like riding based and handling based is unnatural so we want them to seek comfort in us so the best way to develop a bond is being someone that your horse feels safe with and not trying to induce fear regularly in training and it can happen and they can get mildly stressed but you want them to feel comfortable and safe around you and when they feel that way they're going to seek you out as a friend because you're a reinforcing person to be around and you make them feel safe and comfortable and you can get a lot more done with your horses and they're going to be more willing to do stuff for you and they'll actually want to be like in your space with you so that's the best overall handling that i can recommend for them um okay working with defiant mares under saddle best way to get through with them i would ask why are they being defiant because horses cannot be defiant in the sense that they just go screw you like i am doing this deliberately they don't have the capacity to capacity to like plan out and f like think things through to like defy or show malice to their rider so usually a lot of problem behaviors under saddle are either due to pain stress fear or the horse has in some way been reinforced to do that behavior especially if it's something where they seem like they're defying what you're asking them to do of course there's also behaviors under saddle that are like exuberance and stuff um but usually a lot of the problem behaviors are either due to them not properly understanding what we're teaching them like when they're actually having like a consistently bad behavior where you'd go that horse is being naughty or something it's usually due to something pain related not understanding the training feeling stressed in the situation um and we misinterpret it because if it disrupts our goals as humans it's easier to think about it in the sense as like this is so easy this horse knows how to do this they know better this this and that um, because that's how we perceive it but that's not usually the case so it really depends on the behavior I can't really say how I would work with a horse like that without knowing the horse and kind of seeing how they're working but I would say that in any case, if a horse is regularly having behaviors where they're not listening to you and they're just being bad, that like the first thing I would check is a physical issue. And the second thing I would evaluate is like, why is this happening? Like, are they out of balance or do they need more muscle on this one side? Is this exercise hard for them? Is this part of their body stiff? Are they scared of something? Does my saddle fit? and go down that sort of list before ever being like this is like a defiant behavior that this horse is doing to wrong me um and a lot of times like horses do need some sort of outlet especially like if the training is hard for like stress behaviors and sometimes that comes about in like defiance and like stuff like that but unfortunately most horses that i've had like in my program recently that have had like really consistently bad um behaviors where they're like responding to a certain cue the same way all the time or doing something dangerous under saddle all the time um where they're not listening to like a simple cue it's always been like pain related or they're like really stressed and then that's something that I work on because it can be dangerous depending on the scale of what they're doing and it also makes it harder to teach them things um when they're in that state of mind but anyways um how okay wait I already said that do you prefer uh, do you prefer sorry i can't talk i need like a glass of water do you prefer positive reinforcement negative reinforcement or a mix of both i use both in my program and like in most traditional programs you would probably be using both but i would say they tend to lean towards mostly using negative reinforcement but i find that you can get a lot done quicker if you make it highly rewarding for the horse so even if you use like negative reinforcement cues which I do for a lot of things because it's easier to get a horse to seek to investigate stuff if you teach it pressure and release first and you can you can do it without immense pressure 
but then you can also reward the attempt when they come toward it and then eventually they start just seeking your hand and stuff but for like getting a horse to like trailer load and stuff to get them to walk up to something it's easier to do that initial pressure and release with that said if they're really afraid i usually take the pressure off and just get them to do forward attempts with positive reinforcement but under saddle too like and teaching horses even to move off of like commands by pushing over their shoulder and bum but um like you can reinforce that with a reward when you do it and it typically causes the behavior to show quicker and and so that that's what i've found to work the best and like they've studied mixing but not to the same extent as they have with dogs and stuff in horses but it's been found that they feel like it would like adding that to your program would make negative reinforcement less aversive than it would be without that and that would make sense because you're refor you're reinforcing it positively as well obviously so it'd be hard for it to be at perceived as aversive to the horse as it would with the addition of that um but I also would say it's situational because there's like client horses that I have to ride typically a lot more with like pressure and release and doing even stuff on the ground with that, depending on like the owner and like what I'm allowed to do with the horse and th that individual situation than I could get away with with other horses. So it depends, but I kind of base it off of my liberties at any given situation, but there's some things that you really can't fix. Um, using negative reinforcement depending on the state of the horse's like reactivity and that's also something to consider as well um, since horses don't understand respect what do they understand how do they see us so like what we perceive as respect to horses is just training so like teaching them to stay out of their space is just like a behavior that we're reinforcing and then also in some cases people will punish it if they're really up in their space you're teaching them the most reinforcing area to be and when we're training them we're teaching them our language because everything we ask them to do is not within the same context as it would be in a herd setting between horses so what we perceive as respect in a well-behaved horse is really just a well-trained horse that has been shown how to respond in a human environment in a certain way and follows through with it consistently it's not the horse looking at us and being like, I am being respectful. They're doing, this is the behaviors that have been most reinforced and what I have learned. And even within a herd setting with horses, you'll notice it because how they learn how to socialize with new, hor with new herds is off of like reinforcers and punishment again, sometimes in a herd setting. If they're with a really bossy horse and they walk in and they're getting all up in their space and being really pushy, then they learn where the most reinforcing place to be is. And that's the same case with people. But the whole punishment aspect of training with like people and how people typically say to handle horses when they're being perceived as disrespectful it's not reflected in the same manner that it would be in a herd because people don't give the same types of subtle warnings and stuff as horses do. And they also don't perceive us as other horses. So they don't react to us in the same setting. Um, and like with punishment in, in specific using like, this is why I'm, I'm going to, sorry, this is kind of going off topic, but this is, I'm just going to try to explain why like terming horses as understanding respect is a pro is a problem saying that they're being disrespectful implies that it's being done intentionally and that they understand what the concept of respect and like our perception is so it would imply that they know the correct behaviors to exhibit and know the context to exhibit them in and are choosing not to and they're not capable of doing that they don't have a prefrontal cortex um so we have to be careful how we word things because I know what most people mean when they mean respect and it's teaching a horse like the correct manners to be safe around people and easy to handle and listening to us. Um, it's a well-trained horse. But when we say disrespectful, it implies that they're deliberately doing something and they can't do that. And then also a lot of the stuff about respect in a lot of ways people use to justify mass punishment and the problem with that is like even within humans and like studies done on people but like literally honestly like every other animal punishment has a lot of negative implications so using it regularly in training 
is a scary thing to do because we already have a pretty long standing track record of studies that show why this is bad to use on a regular basis. Um, and the language we use to describe horse behavior kind of justifies the overuse of punishment. Um, so that's why I think it's important that people try to look at things like through the lens that the horse would view it through and they don't view each other with respect and they don't view people with respect because they don't have the capacity of understanding um, that concept. Okay. Um, going to go try to go through YouTube comments. Any tips on how to get your horse used to blanketing? So anything with like spooky stuff, I would start with getting the horse to investigate it in your hands and like look at it, seek it out, get comfortable nosing at it, rewarding them for that, and then get used to you like brushing a, a part of it on their side, getting or like first before you even do that, walking closer to them, getting them used to having it closer to them, feeling it on their skin, rewarding them for that, folding it and putting the folded part over them, rubbing them down, getting them used to that, and just basically gradually building up to kind of stretching it over them like a blanket, but doing it slowly because if they shoot around and they're afraid, it's dangerous to do up the blanket. And they also risk getting more afraid of it because if they run away, even once it's not even done up with one buckle, they're more likely to have it come flying off and get more scared of it. So I would do it very slowly in small approximations and reward calm behavior and having you come near it. But if they're very scared, I wouldn't just like throw it over top of them because that's like a great way to have them come flying over top of you and have the blanket come off. But um Anything like that, I would say, like, if the horse is afraid of it, start slowly and reward them for behaving and getting used to it and attempting to interact with the thing that they are afraid of. Um, and you'll notice that the behavior changes a lot quicker. Um, okay. This may not be a behavior question, but maybe welfare. In regards to racing, do they fit the exercise saddles to each thoroughbred, or is it more of a the fit of the rider that's enough? None of the exercise saddles are really fit to the rider because essentially the only thing you fit is like your the length of your stirrup leathers. They're like a flat saddle that you're not sitting in. You don't use. They don't have knee rolls. You don't really have your knees on them ever because um, your stirrups are usually short enough that you don't have them on. Um, so I would say like like the most of the saddles are made like very very much the same it's a half tree it's not a full tree so with that in mind they're easier to fit than would be like a jumping saddle or like a dressage saddle um but they can pinch and they can sit on the wither but since they don't have like a full channel and it's more of like a glorified bareback pad the implications of them not being the perfect fit aren't the same but like certain shapes of horses will have them slide back more or if they're really wide, they might sit more on their wither. So you do need to take fit into account still, but it's not the fit. It doesn't cater to the rider either. Um, and I don't know enough about saddle fit to actually know how you would go about correctly fitting one of those saddles personally. So I just ride in the tack that's on the horse. Um, okay. Why is dominance theory so darn prevalent? I think it's because it's like it's how humans have basically always trained animals until fairly recently as we've used force because we didn't used to even consider the fact that animals might be able to feel like a similar range of emotions to people and that they might be as intelligent as they are. And with dogs, dominance theory was a lot more common, but it started changing like more quickly and more recently because there's more research done on it with horses like people view them as livestock which i think is part of it and since they're so big i find people also justify the use of force on them a lot more because they'll say this is going to be dangerous if this animal reacts a certain way because it's so big um and there's also like not a ton of research done on training horses until fairly recently like there's been some studies done back in like the 90s and stuff that are good and there were some very good horse people from ages ago but as a general rule, the way horses have traditionally always been trained has been using dominance and exploiting their fear to get them to learn things quicker and essentially force them to do it. And since horses are pretty docile animals, it's pretty easy to, well, I guess it, it was easier before they knew the theory of training them to try to force them. And it was less complicated um back then but i would say it's like a, it's ignorance is why it's so prevalent because 
if you look into any of the studies done on it, it's pretty clear that it doesn't hold up and there's not really anyone that's worth that's well-respected or well-educated in the behavioral realm that supports it. And then also like the weird thing about it with horses in specific is that the excuse of saying how big they are is a reason why we need to bully them and really, really get mad at them when they're bad. It's a stupid excuse because nowadays, like when they're working with zoo animals and stuff and really dangerous animals that are actual predators that can like hunt and kill you they usually use positive reinforcement because at the end of the day even if you use force like a horse can out muscle you any day if they decide to um and you can't like technically we can't force them to do anything they could force us to be evacuated off of their backs quite easily but unfortunately since they're such fearful animals we have the illusion that we can force them to do things and it works until it doesn't but i think the rate at which people would get injured by horses would drop dramatically if we stopped using as much fear-based training and thinking that we needed to dominate them to um, be able to ride them safely and work with them um so yeah i would say that okay so someone on instagram asked i know this hormonal gelding who always tried to mount mares during lessons occurred some years ago don't know if the issues the issue was fixed thoughts on why it happened so sometimes like even geldings will mount each other um with that said there is the possibility of horses having like being a ridgling and having one retained testicle and then they would still have like all the hormones of a stallion, but they're imbalanced and they typically act really weird. I wouldn't say that's necessarily the possibility there because it would probably be a more severe behavior than just occasionally. Oh, wait, sorry. She said always mounting them. So perhaps, but also like you can have horses that just have a higher testosterone balance, even once they're gelded if they weren't gelded properly or if there was something left in there in the procedure and there's also horses who will retain stud-like behaviors if they were gelded late and they got a heavy dose of, of testosterone leading up to whenever they were gelded and some geldings just have stallion like behaviors and will mount mares it really depends the only way of actually knowing if it was due to like some sort of hormonal imbalance would be by taking a blood test um but it really depends on the horse. It's not unheard of at all. And in some cases, I've even seen like hormonal mares mount other mares. So it's not even specific to geldings. But in those cases, I would recommend if people are concerned to take a blood test and see. Um, because then if there was ever the chance that they have like a retained testicle or something else, you would be able to know and decide what to do about it if it was something that's fixable. But if not, then you're kind of just, yeah, out of luck. Um Okay. What college do you attend for behavior? What resources are available for us to use on behavior? I go to Guelph University and I highly remec re I can't speak today. Oh my God. Um, sorry, Phoebe. I'm sorry. Um, okay. I go to Guelph University. They have online courses so you can take their courses like pretty much anywhere in the world. As far as I know, I don't think they have like limits on where you have to live country wise to participate. Um, and they have like a lot of really good equine science courses. It's not even just the behavior courses. If there's other stuff about horses that you were interested in, you could probably find a course to take there. And I really like the interface of their website. I've done online courses through other schools before. And it's kind of hit or miss with like how easy it is to get in contact with the professors or how user friendly it is. I like Guelph stuff. Um, they have like a really good library that's full of resources. As for people who aren't in university, it can be a lot harder to get accessible studies to look at for horses because a lot of them require a university login to look at. However, there are certain databases, if you look online, where you can find free access to the same types of studies if you get the name of them. And there also are studies that are available to the general public or that you can at least see parts of without paying for. So I'd recommend looking like through a peer-reviewed peer database like JSTOR, Google Scholar, um, we ours that we use through the university is called Omni. You can, yeah, there's, there's many and it depends on where you live too, because there's more North American based ones. And there's also ones in other areas or there's ones that have mostly American studies and so on and so forth. Um, there's also certain authors and stuff that do 
books on behavior and have a lot of studies in them. Um, the two like big players in the equine behavior world, I would say would be like Paul McGreevy has done like a ton of studies and he has like several books out on the stuff. And also Andrew McLean with like the equitation science. If you look into those, there's a lot of good things and they're like filled with studies that you can look up and also like read parts of in their books that might be cheaper than getting like going to university or getting like access to individual studies. Um, but there's tons of resources and there's been way more studies out within like even the last five years. It's pretty crazy. Um, so there, there's lots out there. It can just be overwhelming. Like if you haven't learned in school how to like determine what a credible source is and where to find such resources, it can be overwhelming to decide like, what studies you can hold you can use to hold the most weight in terms of your opinion and which you probably shouldn't so um there's the courses are great i would recommend those for anyone who can but otherwise you can also absolutely look up and read the studies and get certain books as well but um anywho Young horses who have repeated injuries and long stall rest six to twelve months thoughts like stall rest is so hard on the horse like if they're getting if horses are getting injured and riding really really often where they need tons of stall rest it's like one of those situations where i think that people need to calm down with their expectations or start to like evaluate their training program and what is going so wrong to cause that level of injuries repeatedly um because like things happen and some horses might need longer term stall rest for like a one-off thing but if it repeatedly happens it can be really detrimental to health and even in general just one injury requiring that much stall rest can be really hard on the horse um so i think that that's an aspect of the horse world that i would really love to see people address because it's not a good thing and like if we start heavily considering training practices that result in frequent injuries then we could look into the factors that influence it better and figure out the best way to train horses without causing injury or mental health trauma with how we keep them. How do you keep a horse mentally situated? Um, so I guess they mean, or mentally stimulated, um, to look into like their, like psychological health I would say one of the most important things is actually being outside with other horses and like having the ability to socialize like run around having hay throughout the day not going long periods of time without grazing on anything and getting to interact with their peers is the most important thing because they are such social animals that like the entire practice of keeping them fairly isolated and in small spaces that they can't move around really goes against what is natural for them and like what they need to be happy in an environment and I think even a lot of soundness issues can be related to that so that's the biggest thing I would say to keep them happy and then even in, in training programs if they're actually getting socialized and out with other horses and getting to like be a horse in their free time, even if the training program itself is stressful, they're probably will easier cope with it. Um, so that's the best way to do it. And then the other thing in riding is to just make sure they're not super stressed every time you're riding them and try to get them interested in things and really evaluating the equipment you use and considering if it's painful and, if like, like, I think people, especially with bits, people need to consider how their horse feels with the amount of pressure their hands are using at any given time when they're going to use a harsh bit. But um, anyways, what is the best way to correct herd bound behaviors? Um, so for herd boundedness, like it's a very, very normal trait for horses as herd animals. So I would say like, getting mad at them for it is one of the worst things that people do to handle it is like when they're acting silly and stressed, just getting after them will generally increase the stress, especially since she's young. Um, I would recommend working with her like close ish to the herd and then gradually extending the distance and really heavily reinforcing her being around you and calm behaviors around you. But you're probably going to need to have her a little bit closer initially and gradually extend the space because being too far away, if she's in a high state of stress, it's a lot harder to influence her behavior and actually train. So you have to find a space where you can capture her attention for 
longer periods of time than you might be able to if she's super stressed and work in those situations and then gradually get her comfort level to the point where she can be away from a herd setting and gradually extend that and work with it. So essentially what you're doing is like really instilling her confidence in being around you and then making that enough when she's in an, in an unnatural setting away from the herd. Um, okay, so I'm just going to try to Read. I had a horse who's abused and was shut down and bolt with his neck, lo his neck locked. So one reins and circles were near possible. What, what advice would you have with working with this other than softness? I would look into the situations that he does that in and heavily assess like what the potential triggers are, because if he was abused, like horses can sustain like mental damage that causes like neurotic behaviors from abuse. And that would probably be considered a neurotic behavior. And there, there can be really weird triggers that are hard to nail down. But if you could find the triggers and then really work on getting the confidence to not have the horse get in that state of mind in the first place, that would be the way, the way to avoid the bolting. Because the problem with horses when they're in a high state of stress is like they go into flight mode and they can literally not be thinking at all and nothing you can do will work. And it's a very dangerous state for the horse to be in for a rider or a handler to be around them. So the way to try to work on that is to try to like keep them below that threshold of fear and work at the lower levels of fear to get relaxation so they don't get themselves as worked up to that level. And like with that particular horse, the bolting is just a sim symptom of that. With other horses, it might be like freaking out when they're pulling back or if they feel trapped, rearing up and like flipping over and stuff. Basically, what you need to do is try to get them wound down and work with them when they're not that high stress because once they escalate to that level like you're essentially trying to yell at a brick wall and they're too scared to listen and trying to escape the situation that got them that stressed and it's a very natural behavior for horses but it's what makes them so dangerous um and i think like i have to end this soon because it's almost been an hour but i'll take like a few more questions and then I'm going to close this. Best suggestions slash ways to bring your horse back to work after not working for a year. I think like if you have the means of doing it, that hacking is great. And like just going, starting off with like really short hacks at the walk and like doing stuff like that on like varied terrain, like sloping hills and like stuff like that. And gradually extending the amount of time they spend walking and then also like adding trot and stuff. If you don't have that, I would recommend going, working in the arena and then starting off with like walk and maybe very little trot work, depending on how fit the horse was prior to the year. Um, and then you can also do like practice lateral work, like leg yielding, getting them walking over poles, um, shoulder in, like once they get fitter, like lots of circling, getting them to supple up at the walk first. And then essentially you're gradually extending the intervals at which you're doing the harder work um, as they gain fitness. And if you can add hacking into that type of work it would be perfect because then if you have like a harder day where you're doing lots of pulls or lateral work while they're still getting into things a nice like easy hack at a forward walk is probably really nice after a harder work day or after a day off and um that would be the best way to do it and get them into it without them getting like sour from their muscles being sore or from doing the same thing all the time and yeah um how do I go about switching barns? Um, so it really depends on your situation. Your barn, if you've been there for a long time, it's obviously going to be a lot harder than if you haven't. Um, but I would recommend that you start looking for barns first and kind of like shopping online, kind of like seeing what's near you, what interests you, and maybe calling a few places, getting some information on them. And even like so long as you're not in like a supremely gossipy area where it's likely to get back to your trainer before you make a decision, you can go look at them in person and kind of decide, maybe like audit a lesson there, go look and see how their lesson horses are cared for and decide where you want to move. And then once you found a place, especially if you're wanting to continue riding until you find a place, I would not tell your trainer until you found a place. And then when you tell your trainer, you can be like, hey, like, I really appreciate everything you've done for me and like really loved what I learned with you. And I've actually decided to 
move on and I found another place to go that where I'll continue my riding journey, but I respect and appreciate everything you've done with me, blah, 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 all nice. And then say thank you. And if you're leaving on bad terms, you don't have to be nice and be to that extent, but you can be civil and just be like, thanks. Um, and move on but generally speaking like some trainers obviously can get upset and be kind of like mean and petty but usually people understand it it's like a part of the business sometimes people need to move on sometimes they want to go somewhere closer to their house or they want different riding options or they want like different facility options or the training style just isn't meshing and it's totally fine don't overthink it and just do it and find wherever it makes you happy um why do you give your horses omega oil and opinions on beet pulp? So omegas are really good for them. And I also like adding an oil because it's super palatable. So for like hiding the zinc and copper, especially the zinc, they don't like the taste of. So the oil makes it more flavorful and they like the taste of it better. So they're more likely to finish their grain and eat all of their supplements. Um, and as for beet pulp, like a lot of people swear by it and really like it. Um, I think it's fine. I've fed it in the past and I have no issues with it, but for my horses, I prefer doing soaked alfalfa cubes more. Um, I find that horses generally find that more palatable than the beet pulp. I found that a lot of the thoroughbreds I've gotten off of the racetrack don't like beet pulp. Um, so that's just my preference for it. I also just don't like the smell of beet pulp personally. So maybe that plays into it. But yeah, that that's my opinion. And then also I got the cubes partly because... Um, I like I usually soak them like I said but if someone were to feed for me and didn't properly soak them it's not the end of the world because they're made to also be eaten dry whereas a lot of beet pulp is meant to always be soaked and can cause issues if not so I did that kind of as an extra safety but um are dressage saddles for hacking they can be you can hack in whatever you want like whatever you're comfortable in you can just go for it and go hacking in um I've gone hacking in dressage or jumper saddles or Western saddles or a bareback pad. You can kind of just do whatever you want, like whatever's comfy for you and your horse. Um, what's your best tips for a nervous horse? So for a nervous horse, which can be really, okay, I know how hard riding a nervous horse is and it can be really hard to do the right thing all the time. Um, but your best way to train them is to not get mad at them. Like if they ever overreact if they ever buck bolt rear spook shy to the side like won't walk just assume it's because they're stressed give them the benefit of the doubt and make your entire job just about getting them to calm down and relax and settle down and just be that supportive kind friend for them to get them confident and happy in a situation for a nervous horse that might mean getting off of them sometimes and doing work in hand with them and just getting them settled in a situation. It might mean not being able to show them right away and having to postpone show plans for longer than you might with a different horse. And the other thing with nervous horses is that I would highly, highly discourage, like more so than other types of horses, but I would also discourage it with them. I would really be careful to not use punishment with them basically ever if you can avoid it, especially in training on a repeated basis, because the problem with punishment, and like I said, there's been a lot of studies that have shown like all the bad repercussions of using it repeatedly in a training program. Um, the problem with punishment is that it doesn't tell them what they did wrong. And with a nervous horse, their brain is already going a mile a minute. They're already in flight mode and afraid of things. So if you're only going to be like, no, that's the wrong answer, but I don't, I'm not going to tell you the right one. And they don't know the right one. So you're essentially punishing tries for them because since they're nervous, they might act reactively and do something before they actually were asked or just have a hard time settling and then you're punishing them for a try and they're already nervous and they're even less likely to relax and be in the thinking place to do what you want to ask them to do so be the kind friend that you can be with them and it can be really hard to do sometimes and if you make a mistake address it and learn from that mistake for next time like if they go way over the top freaking out do something dangerous or they just won't settle look at that ride and kind of be like, hmm, what, what do I think set this off today and how can I fix it for next time? And then try to find a better way of addressing whatever caused them to be super nervous that day. And that's the best thing you can do because Milo's quite a nervous horse. And for him, like his exuberance or nervousness can be 
it can be caused by a lot of things like with uh, with most horses if the weather is cooler they're more reactive and um likely to be fearful if they see something that they're afraid of or just be super playful and for him that's super true so in the winter he's always spookier or more excitable than he is in the summertime and that's kind of just what he needs to do and in the winter time like if i'm not gonna like make sure that he ran around the pasture before or turn him loose it would be foolish for me to get mad at him if he needs to like snort he sometimes strikes out at leaves falling to the ground and like does stuff like that like I would never discipline him for that type of thing because it's not going to get me a win um and like even with him stopping at shows and stuff in the past if I were to get mad at him for that he's just gonna be even bigger in his reactions and it's never gotten me ahead and it's initially honestly what I was recommended to do with him in the beginning when I first got him by lots of different trainers and if I hadn't initially listened to them and x scenario about being too harsh or impatient with him we would have saved a lot of work in trying to fix the problem behaviors that being too impatient at any given time caused so for anyone that has a horse that's like frequently stressed and stuff i would just say like try not to get stressed with them or angry with them and just be the person that can kind of sit there and just hold their hand um that's what i call it is they just need you to hold their hand be there hold their hand and make me like it's okay we're here. We'll do this. Um, best size pasture for two horses. I would say like as big as possible. Like I would honestly die to have like a huge property that like has tons and tons of acres of land, but like, it's literally like $4 million for two acres of land here. Like that's not even really that far off of an exaggeration. I swear to God. So it's harder to have that here, but like, if you have the land to do it, like I would just be like, give them the turnout of their dreams, like let them go wherever they want. And well, not wherever they want, but you know what I mean? Like, I think that nine times out of 10 horses are in turnouts that could be bigger and that are technically too small. But in those cases, you kind of just need to watch their behavior and um, decide like how you can enrich their life in that setting. If you can't change it. Um, what what are your thoughts on flanking? I have been suggested to do it on my pony who bucks, but I don't really like the idea of flanking. Do you mean like putting a flank strap on him or like, is that what you mean? That's what I'm assuming it is, but I haven't heard that. I've heard of people using like buck stops and stuff, but yeah, like I think that's a stupid idea. <laughs> I've never heard of it. Like I've never heard someone recommend that. I think that it would be more likely to get a really reactive response if something were to touch him on his flank or bother him for the next time i'm assuming the intention is just trying to get him to buck until he gives up um but you don't know when that will be and in any case training with a horse you shouldn't throw like some fearful stimulus at them and not know how far it'll go before they stop um, so with bucking, I would say to try to address what is causing the buck. If it's out of exuberance and stuff, then you could teach him a different behavior to exhibit instead of that. Um, or find a way, find a behavior that conflicts with bucking where he can't buck while he's doing it and cue that whenever he starts bucking. Um, for example, like with the race horses that are really like really exuberant because they're coming out of being a, in a stall and they need to play. Um, I don't like getting mad at them for bucking or doing anything that heavily punishes it. So I'll try to do behaviors that conflict with the buck, like leg yielding them or doing like a transition um, or maybe galloping them a little bit more forward, which you probably wouldn't want to do in a riding arena, but stuff like that to try to change the behavior. But also bucking can be due to other underlying factors. So before you handle it from like a training perspective, I would try to nail down why you think they're exhibiting the behavior and then decide how to address it based off of that. Um. <laughs> but um, yeah, sorry, I talk really fast sometimes. So hopefully people can understand what I'm saying because sometimes I don't even understand what I'm saying while I'm saying it because like it's just fast. <laughs> um on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the cutest, how cute do you think a horse with a cowboy hat is? A little silly, but legit, lol. A very cute. Honestly, horses in, like, costumes of any sort, I think, either think is, like, the cutest or, like, the funniest thing ever. Like, it's just hilarious. They look so silly. Um, how long should I wait before the work, before the start working with a new horse? Um... 
like if you're reading like how long to let them settle in before you start working with them if you're getting a horse who you know is more nervous or might have difficulty settling in i would recommend giving them more time than you would another horse and like it doesn't mean you don't have to handle them at all but i would like if they've not been handled i would give them like a couple of days of just settling and not being handled and kind of getting used to their environment um but if they've been handled, you could just groom them and do enjoyable stuff before starting the training so that they get to know you and kind of like know the basics and then decide how to build your program from there. Because people have to remember that like training with a horse can be like even just grooming them in their paddock. Like if you have a really nervous horse that you've been having difficulty catching or like approaching and like training for them can just be getting them to approach you. So you can start like doing little things based on the horse to address certain problem behaviors at the base level before ever doing like anything super complicated. So it just really depends. Um, and it also depends on like how much time you have and if there's any time constraints, because obviously that all plays into it because like, for example, me getting horses in training, I can't give them like a week to settle in even if they need it unless the owner is paying for that you know like so there are time constraints and you have to be creative and think outside the box if there's certain limitations to how you have to handle them but um okay how about the size of a pasture do you think half an acre is too small for two horses if you're using it for grass year round definitely because the grass would be down um, and they wouldn't be able to eat it. But if you're feeding on it, that's honestly better than most horses in traditional environments where you do not have um, the type of space that you do on large plots of farmland. Like a lot of horses don't even have half an acre ever to run out on if they're in like an urban boarding setting. So in terms of space to like play and be horses, that's enough to keep them enriched. But if you're using it for food, then you probably need to supplement. Um, yeah. How should you get a nervous horse into a trailer? So if you go on my YouTube channel, I actually did a video on that exact thing and it shows it in depth, like how I taught Banksy how to load. And then I also work with Pogo in it and show how I worked on him with loading. Um, so that would be better than how I could explain it on here. So I'd recommend scrolling down and checking it out. I think I did it. Um, I can't remember if it was last year already, maybe. Um, but it's just like teaching your horse how to load and it would be on my YouTube channel if you just have a peek um and it's pretty like it's pretty simple like if you were watching earlier same thing with how you like teach a horse to approach fearful objects but yeah check out the video um are you gonna do a halloween photo shoot with banksy perhaps like i haven't had time to get like anything halloween related with the horses and like some of the cool costumes i would want to do require painting them but since i live in canada it's like too cold to give them a bath so i can't really wash the paint off because they'd have to go outside after and they wouldn't dry quickly in this climate right now um so it limits what i can do with them a lot and then it also is hard because some halloween costumes are a lot of work to create so i suppose it depends on how busy i get this week and how much time i have to accomplish that but hopefully um i'm hoping to like even if it's not banksy i'm hoping to dress milo up if we go on this halloween hunt that i'm supposed to be doing but yeah and that's yeah that that's kind of the plan for halloween if i do it'll probably be him but yeah and yeah absolutely like i'm around at the ho local horse shows for any local riders and if you see me you can come say hi but i'm pretty introverted so just a heads up that i'm like not as chatty as i am <laughs> answering questions on on live as i am in person but it's always nice to meet people i'm just a shy person um but yeah, so after the pandemic, hopefully we will actually get like a show season and stuff next year and get to do fun things because this year has been boring. It's the month of the main event right now and we can't do anything because it's canceled because of COVID. Um, so it's like not the most fun, but oh, crazy times. And yeah, um, can we DM you on Instagram with questions? It depends because with training questions, I have to give priority to the ones that I'm asked on Patreon. So I'd never get around to like everybody's questions on Instagram um, because I do have like the Patreon tiers for people to ask questions. So if you want to guarantee that they're answered in detail, that's the best way to do it. I sometimes have time to answer DM questions and I also sometimes answer questions on my question tabs, but I give priority to the other methods of asking questions or doing them for like lives and stuff so it, it depends um 
and then yeah for anyone that's interested in like the training tier if you have like videos of your specific course and stuff i do have a training tier on my patreon where you can send in stuff on um for about your horse for training and stuff and i can answer them and that's kind of where i give priority to but i try to do lives like this so that everyone gets a chance because it, it's just it's busy um but anyways thank you everyone for watching and i hope everyone has a lovely day and i hope that made sense because like i like i literally just like when i talk for long enough i fail to keep talking properly and sometimes i start off not even talking properly and i'm hard to understand so i'm sure i said like a lot of stupid sounding sentences um but anyways thank you for watching and i appreciate all these questions because i'm learning lots in my course right now and it's very inspiring so it's nice to be able to do stuff like this and kind of share some of the stuff that i learned so um and it gives me a chance it helps me remember stuff too because i get to repeat it out loud and again and again so anyways thank you for watching thank you for your questions my dog wants out of my room immediately so i'm gonna go and turn off this live now because she's decided she's done as well so have a good night everybody